of your employees support the government in its efforts to serve Canadians in both official languages. But their efforts go well beyond this. I was moved by the very inclusive, respectful, and committed work that is done by these employees. Of their efforts is the new Gender and Sexual Diversity Glossary, where it's free to find the English and French equivalents to 193 concepts on gender and sexual diversity. The Bureau also offers international languages, sign language, translation in five Indigenous languages, and counting, including recent work to include Willistic Gal Letaway Wagon, a language with only a few hundred speakers in my home riding. The MP has provided a translation of her statement. The interpreter will now read this. Malasi Language Honor Code. Grandmothers and grandfathers, thank you for our language that you have saved for us. It is now our turn to save it for the ones who are not born yet. May they, that be the truth. Oh, let it snow. It certainly has been the theme song in my province of Newfoundland and Labrador this winter. On fait tout cette... And all of this snow has provided a wonderful white powdering for winter carnivals. I'd like to thank all the volunteers and groups in my riding of Long Range Mountains who organize winter celebrations in their communities. This is also a huge boost to many not-for-profits, as well as small businesses, especially those in the tourism industry. So embrace the winter and lace up your skates, go ice fishing, try downhill or cross-country skiing, jump on a snowmobile and experience the hundreds of miles of groomed trails. If you're adventurous, try zip lining, take a thermos of hot chocolate, go sliding with the family, or my favorite snowshoeing with dogs. Il n'y a rien de tel qu'on... There's nothing like a wonderful dip in the forest to make your winter event a success. Your fancy, get out and enjoy, so continue to let it snow. Merci. Well said, well said. The Honourable Member for Oxford. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I rise in the House today to recognize the accomplishments of three dairy farms in my riding. Oxford is a unique riding, have a strong presence in both the manufacturing and automotive industry, but Oxford is also known as the dairy capital of Canada. Today I would rec like to recognize the hard work and dedication of Laren Wood Farms, Darcraft Farms, and Wilmar Lee Farm, who were recently awarded the Master Breeder Shield. This prestigious award is presented to dairy farmers who have achieved excellent health, productivity, and longevity, longevity for their herd, herd of cattle. A Master Breeder Shield is a lifelong dream of many dairy farmers and serves as a testament to years of hard work and dedication. Again, I would like to congratulate these three Oxford farms as only 19 farms across Canada to receive this award in 2019. Oxford is truly the dairy capital of Canada. The Honourable Member for Outremont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to pay tribute to an amazing institution in my riding of Outremont called Radio Centreville which is celebrating its 45th anniversary. Radio Centreville is a multicultural radio station that encourages lively debate and gives a voice to those who often don't have one in media streams. This was the case of Fraîchement Vendredi. It's an inclusive program for the LGB2 community, which is celebrating its first anniversary. This is an inclusive program that allows the LGB2 community in Montreal to discuss and debate uh, values and increase their media presence. Mr. Speaker, our local media plays a key role in the daily lives of our communities, and I'm so happy to pay tribute to the wealth that they bring us. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Surrey, er, excuse, the Honourable Deputy de Trois. The Honourable Member for Trois Rivières, Mr. Speaker. I would like to pay tribute to an avant-garde character, Mr. Guégon Voivin, the PDG of the Trois-Rivières port. He received a prize at a gala at the Chamber of Commerce of Montréci last Thursday. Mr. Morin was able to organize the port of Trois-Rivières and they have a plan for 2020, 2030 for their entire team. Thanks to him, the port now has modern infrastructure that is integrated with the site. This deep port of Trois-Rivières is one of the best and most important ports in Quebec and in Eastern Canada. It generates thousands of jobs and economic benefits 
$210 million it generates for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Boivin was a visionary who was able to make the Trois-Rivières port a remarkable one. Thank you. Honourable Member for Surrey Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud today to rise to congratulate Govan Deal from L.A. Matheson Secondary on receiving the prestigious Lauren Scholarship Award. Govan was selected from more than 5,000 students from across Canada as one of Lauren Scholars awarded a $100,000 scholarship that will go towards post-secondary education. Govan started a basketball program for elementary students, volunteered at Camp Next, did patrols for the Surrey Crime Prevention Society, helped the Kinsman Lodge, and raised funds to build schools for an NGO called the Seek Awareness Foundation. He is a Matheson Mustang and an exemplary Canadian. Congratulations, Govan. Good job. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, approximately 8 million Canadians suffer from addiction. Most suffer alone and in silence. But my friend Natalie Harris is trying to change this. Throughout my time in Ottawa, I've had the honour of meeting countless mental health champions. Few have touched my life the way that Natalie Harris has. Natalie's struggle with PTSD and addiction have been well documented. But what people don't know is truly how amazing she is. Natalie is a kind, compassionate individual whose journey from the abyss to her work today is a testament to her driving will to survive and to help others. Natalie's new project, writing Get Well Cards for those suffering from addiction, is a direct effort to help those in need and at the same time raise awareness of this important issue. Tomorrow, after caucus, from 12 noon to 1.30 p.m., please join colleagues from across all party lines as we host Natalie in the Speaker's Lounge in West Block, room 233S. We are working together to bring awareness to the terrible disease that is addiction. It is my hope, Mr. Speaker, that the words of encouragement we offer help build confidence, break the cycle of addiction, and maybe, just maybe, Mr. Speaker, will save a life. The Honourable Member for Brampton South. Ooh. A safe, affordable, and accessible place to call home. To raise awareness about poverty and homelessness in Brampton South, I took part in the coldest night of the year, a walkathon hosted by Regeneration Outreach Community. I want to thank Ted Brown and all of the organizations and volunteers who made this event a success and make a difference in our community every day. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday, 425 walkers raised more than $100,000 for those in need. I want to recognize Pastor Jamie Holtham, the Boys and Girls Club, Rotary Club, Peer Police, First Responders, and teams from Grace United, St. Paul's United, and Christ Churches, and many others. Mr. Speaker, I'm also proud that our government is doing its part by investing in real change that was lifted over 1 million Canadians out of poverty okay. since 2015. Okay. There's more to be done to ensure that every Canadian has a fair chance to succeed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're here. Well said. The Honourable Member for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, I attended the funeral of my niece, Cheryl, two weeks ago, and six months before that, the funeral of her father. Mr. Speaker, cancer <laughs> impacts all families. It doesn't care about your age, your income, your job, your dreams for the future, or where you live. In rural Canada, it's often difficult to access health care in a timely manner, adding the additional challenges of Canada's more remote places, where air travel to see a doctor is often a requirement and complicates the access even more. Our health centres and staff can do amazing work, but it has its limitations. I really want to make sure we proceed with our platform promise to make sure that every Canadian has access to a family doctor or primary, primary health care team and to improving the quality of care for nearly 5 million Canadians who today lack access. Because, Mr. Speaker, our lives depend on it. The Honourable Member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister found a rather simplistic solution by telling environmentalists that he would plant 2 billion trees by 2050. He 
to get elected, he tried to pull the wool over the people's eyes, and he's been, never been able to tell the truth and to say that his liberal government would not achieve its Paris targets. It's a sign of weakness to talk such rubbish, but that's what you get with a liberal prime minister. I'd like to remind him that thousands of trees have already been planted, and it isn't enough to protect our environment. But if there are a few extra trees to plant in Canada, there is room around the St. Augustin Lake in Port Neuf Jacques Cartier. The city of St. Augustin wants to protect the environment and has a tree planting plan for its lake. Where can we find these government tree planting programs? Because in Port Neuf Jacques Cartier, we want to take concrete action to improve our carbon footprint, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Thunder Bay Rainy River. Speaker, I rise today on a happy occasion. This is the first day of the Special Olympics in Thunder Bay that are going to run nice. for the next four days. Thank you. I want to thank all the very many volunteers that have made this happen. I want to thank the coaches and the parents of all the athletes for their considerable contributions. But most of all, I want to congratulate the athletes. For the athletes, I say, try hard. Do your best, and most of all, enjoy it. But maybe I can ask the whole house to join me and give a big round of applause for all the Special, special Olympic athletes this week. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Tobik Mectaquak. Merci, Mr. Thanks to Mr. Speaker. To recognize the immense contribution of Black Canadians as part of our month-long celebration of Black History Month, the Great Riding of Tobique Mactaquack is home to the northernmost route of the Underground Railroad. Brave men and women fleeing slavery found their way to Fort Fairfield, Maine, where they were given refuge in places such as Friends Church. Once they were able to make their final journey to freedom. They would set out through the woods until they reached Tomlinson Lake in Carlingford, New Brunswick. Once here, they knew they were safe and began their new lives in Canada as free people. They overcame many challenges and contributed immensely to a better Canada. Passionate and tireless volunteers have worked to preserve these stories and valuable parts of our history. They hold an annual hike in the fall where families can walk the trails and learn the stories. I would encourage all members to learn more about this part of Canadian history at Tomlinson Lake, hikeforfreedom.ca. Although freedom was reached at Tomlinson Lake, the journey to true equality and recognition continues. Thank you, Merci Wawilam. The Honourable Member for Kamloops Thompson Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Saturday night I was delighted to attend Beef Bash 2020. This was an opportunity for ranchers and those related to the cattle industry to come together before calving season. We enjoyed prime rib, filet mignon and beef ribs, followed by a night of cowboy dancing. Our hard-working ranching industry creates a high-quality and delicious product. What many people are not aware of is their role as environmental stewards. Ranching has a significant positive impact on grasslands and carbon sequestration. I invite you to watch the video, Guardians of the Grasslands. This week, the cattlemen are here in Ottawa. It's important to do a special shout out to my constituent, David Haywood Farmer, who's finishing yes. his two-year term as president of the, Cam or the Canadian Cattle Association and has done so much important work promoting the industry here and abroad. Thank you, David, for your leadership and Bonnie and family for allowing him to dedicate himself to this important role. Yes. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, today almost 400 delegates from the Canadian Labour Congress are on Parliament Hill talking about issues facing workers. Here, here. Workers need this government to finally make good on their promise of a universal pharmacare program, they need a $15 an hour minimum wage, and they need laws to protect their pensions and benefits. On this government's watch, when Sears failed, the lives of thousands of workers and retirees across the country were devastated. And what did this government do in response? Nothing. Workers and retirees are still at risk. Workers can still get ripped off when companies go bankrupt. Just last month, Barrymore Furniture in Toronto claimed bankruptcy and abruptly closed their doors. Because the Liberals failed to fix the laws, close to 50 workers not only lost their jobs, but also lost out on severance and benefit payments that they are owed. For some of them, it's close to $50,000. When will the Liberals take action and keep their promise to workers? The Honourable Member for Belay-Chambly. Mr. Speaker, 
I'm speaking today on behalf of Jemmy, Jenny Selgado, who is a rapper and a writer-composer, who said the following, A few seconds should convince you that we're worth listening to. A few seconds to make you question, we're listening to you. You should see in each of these seconds an image of your own mirror every day. The new that we're, the we that we're talking about here should remain suspended at your lips. Millions of words, people, tomorrows that no one is listening to. Are they worth listening to? We need to say them together as a country, as one people. A few seconds to unite us to talk about this us, to talk about this division of our, in our history. Because today, I would like to thank you for listening. The mic is yours. And let's never forget, the floor is always ours. The Honourable Member for Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Yesterday, the Alberta Court of Appeal ruled in a 4-1 to one decision that the legislation that brought in the federal carbon tax erodes the authority of the provinces, calling it a constitutional Trojan horse. Our country is based on the rule of law and the division of powers. This Liberal government knew from the start that their carbon tax encroaches on the rights of the provinces, yet they passed it anyway. Not only is the carbon tax a cash grab scam that does nothing for the environment, charges a tax on a tax and cuts into the bottom line of Canadian businesses and households, but a power grab by the federal government. Yep. The truth is, Canadians are struggling to make ends meet under a government that opposes resource development, allows radical activists to ignore the law and charges a carbon tax on everything. If the Liberals really cared about the Constitution and Canadians, they would scrap the carbon tax right now. The Honourable Member for Ottawa West, McKeon. On Sunday, I had the pleasure of joining a remarkable group of young people in my riding who represent the best in our community. When tragedy strikes a community, as it did on January 8th, when 18-year-old Maniok Akal, or Manny to his friends, a popular football player and rapper, was killed, it can either divide a community or bring them together. On Sunday, over 200 youth came together at the Boys and Girls Club for a basketball game to raise funds for Manny's family. In the face of unspeakable loss, these young people brought together sponsors from 10 different community organizations, including Ottawa Community Housing and the Britannia Woods Community House, to raise thousands of dollars and help to heal a community that has been through so much pain. These youth already know something we should all remember, that we are stronger together. Thank you to all the volunteers that, we, that showed us how a community can persevere and find comfort and strength in the face of tragedy. Thank you. Thank you. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the Prime Minister was a teacher before he got elected, and he has taught protesters a valuable lesson. They can hold illegal blockades, bring our... I, I'm, I, order. 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 This, this, this session's not really starting off well. I just wanted to point that out and ask everybody to take a deep breath. And we'll go back to the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, we know he's a teacher because we've all seen his picture in the yearbook. We know that he has taught, he has taught protesters a valuable lesson. They can bring our economy to its knees. They can hold illegal blockades, holding up our rail traffic and lead, leading to layoffs. And he will do absolutely nothing. Does the Prime Minister realize that his weakness has caused the situation to spiral out of control? Safety. Mr. Speaker, it's certainly not weakness to demonstrate a strong commitment to dialogue and reconciliation. And last Friday, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister couldn't have been clearer. He acknowledged and recognized the impact that these blockades are having, and he said unequivocally the barricades must come down. And the law, and the law must be obeyed. 
Mr. Speaker, as you know, we do not instruct our police officers in their operations, but we trust the police to do the job that they're currently doing for us. And Mr. Speaker, we urge all Canadians, obey the law, allow the trains to start moving again, and come back to the table to resume that important dialogue. Well, minute, uh, met a leader of the opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, his weakness has emboldened these protesters. It took that him days before he would yeah. even call them illegal. And uh, the first two weeks, he was telling police not to do their job and not to move in and remove it. But it's not just his weakness that is affecting the blockades, Mr. Speaker. It's also affecting important investments in our energy sector. Now, the tech mine had its application approved by an independent regulator. It was sitting on the cabinet table for months since July. Why did the Prime Minister wait so long before making a decision on Tech Frontier? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Member is aware, this was a decision made by Tech. We respect that decision, and I'm sure it was a difficult one. The decision made by Tech Resources and the company sent to me by... So the Honourable Minister can continue now. The decision made by the company and the letter sent to me by the company's CEO demonstrate clearly the need for all levels of government to be working together to deliver on climate action and on clean growth. We need to take action on climate change to reduce pollution, and in doing so, we will provide business certainty. Here, here. The leader of the opposition. The minister doesn't seem to realize that he's part of the government that created the regime that forced tech to pull out. But it was their decision to wait months before making a, a final decision on tech. But it's not just his energy approvals process that is causing problems. It's also his signature policy, the carbon tax. Now, yesterday, the Alberta Court of Appeal ruled, and I quote, we recognize there may well be those who favor ending for further oil and gas development and even shutting down the entire oil and gas industry. Chief amongst them would be Alberta's foreign oil and gas competitors. So why is the Prime Minister doing the dirty work of Canada's foreign competition? <laughs> I think, Mr. Speaker, it's important to set the record straight. The Tech Frontier Review was actually done under SIA 2012. SIA 2012 was the process that was put into place by Stephen Harper's government, of which Jason Kenney was a Minister of the Crown. The decision that was made by Tech Frontier was independent of the review, but I will say that one of the problems with SIA 2012 was that it forced all of the various difficult issues to the back end. We have sure. fixed that through yes. the Impact Assessment Act by ensuring that the big issues are found dealt with early on in the process. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, the government talks over and over again about reconciliation with First Nations. The best reconciliation possible is to work hand-in-hand -hand with First Nations. But unfortunately, because of this government's inertia, 14 First Nations in Alberta today will have nothing, because the Tech Frontier Project no longer exists. For nine months, the Liberal government did everything it could to hinder this project, which resulted in these 14 First Nations having nothing. Why did it drag on this decision for nine months? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, this was a decision that was made by Tech. We respect their decision, and I'm sure that it was not an easy decision to make. The decision made by Tech Resources shows clearly that it is important for all levels of government to work together in order to ensure that we deliver on climate change and to ensure clean growth. We have to take climate change action in order to reduce pollution and to provide business certainty. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to actually congratulate the Minister on the quality of his French. His French is very good, and I agree when he says that we should work together. There were 14 First Nations who were willing to work together, along with the Tech Frontier partners, in order to bring this $10 billion project to fruition. It would have created 10,000 jobs, but for nine months, this government just invented reason after reason not to act, and so nothing is going to happen. Why did they work against those 14 First Nations who wanted this project to go ahead? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I stated, this was a decision that was made by Tech. We respect their decision. Mr. Speaker, as Tech Resources said in its letter, World 
capital markets are changing, and investors and clients need jurisdictions that implement a permanent framework that covers climate change and project implementation. We need clean growth. We agree with this. And what is most productive is to have certainty in this environment, certainty for businesses and workers. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Mr. Speaker, yesterday you were refer referring to an expression about cruising for a bruising. Well, they seem to really incarnate that. Now, this is a crisis. There's a rail crisis. It's not just an Indigenous crisis. It's not just a government crisis. There's so many crises, it's hard to know what to call it. Now, yesterday, the minister responsible for Indigenous services said he was afraid that this situation would degenerate. Well, there has been a failure. And what I'd like to know is, will the prime minister go and meet with the hereditary chiefs in Wet'suwet'en because he has been invited? The Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Well, uh, the answer is that the work has always been based on a peaceful resolution to this crisis so that we can reestablish trust on all partners' parts. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ganawaki, Lennoxville, Restigouche, Kanasataki. And a few days ago, Saint Lambert, without mentioning many other areas in Canada. Will the government envisage doing something other than what has led to this failure? Will there be a temporary suspension of police intervention? Can the Prime Minister put his ministers on a plane, put himself on a plane, and go to British Columbia and resolve this issue? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we have, we have and will continue to engage in dialogue with, on this issue, but it's also very important, Mr. Speaker, to acknowledge and recognize the impact that this rail, these rail disruptions are having on Canadians right across the country. It, it access, access to chemicals to keep their, their water clean, uh, getting products to, to factories so that people can continue to work. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have urged the people on those barricades to lift the barricades, to allow the rail service to resume, and to obey the law. And in those circumstances where it is not, we trust law enforcement across this country who are properly instructed and properly led to uphold and enforce the law. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much. I met an individual in Quebec who says that he needs dental help, but he can't afford it. At the same time, there are wait lists. People are waiting for dental, free dental services. Clearly, people need dental services, but they can't afford them. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge that people need dental work, but that they can't afford it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I understand that the Health Committee is preparing to undertake a thorough study on dental care, and I look forward to receiving the recommendations, and I thank the member for his advocacy. The Honourable Deputy de Burn the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. But the Prime Minister has an opportunity to do something about it right now. Right now. There are millions of Canadians who can't take care of their teeth because they simply can't afford it. Now, the Liberals are planning a massive tax giveaway where the most benefit flows to the wealthiest Canadians. Yep. Our plan is to target that measure to benefit those who need it most, allowing us to fund a national dental care. So instead of helping the wealthiest Canadians, will the Prime Minister work with us to make sure 4.3 million Canadians can take care of their teeth? Sure. Sure. The Honourable Health Minister. Again, for his question, as he knows that uh, my mandate letter specifically tasks me to look at the possibility of dental care for Canadians, and I think the health committee is one of the best places to do that. It is obviously made up of partisans from across the aisle, and it is uh, going to be, I'm sure, a very thoughtful and reflective study. And I look forward to hearing the recommendations. Thank you. The honourable opposition house leader. Well, it turns out the liberal carbon tax is not only useless and is driving away jobs, 
but an Alberta court said yesterday it's also unconstitutional. The court ruled federal and provincial governments are co-equals. The federal government is not the parent, and the provincial governments are not its children. In other words, these Liberals have no right imposing a carbon tax here, here. on Alberta or any other province for that matter. So, Respect the Constitution, respect the provinces, and cut the useless carbon tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have already heard from the Courts of Appeal in Ontario and Saskatchewan, both of which determined that the federal plan is well within federal jurisdiction. The Alberta Court of Appeal's decision is one step in this process. We look forward to the Supreme Court of Canada's deliberations in March and are confident that the price on pollution is fully within federal jurisdiction. Tackling climate change should not be a partisan issue. It is a scientific issue. It is not an aspirational issue. We need to focus on addressing climate change, and this is an important measure in doing that. to combat global emissions. It hurts commuters, it hurts farmers, it hurts small businesses, and it is putting a huge strain on national unity in this country. The court, in essence, said that if it was upheld, hypothetically, the government could dictate to individuals the temperature of their home or whether they drive a car or not. Clearly, nobody trusts this Prime Minister with that kind of power. So again, when will the Liberals scrap this useless, unity-killing, job-killing carbon tax? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, I rise in this House as an MP from Ontario, but also as a grateful daughter of Alberta. And let me say, Mr. Speaker, I understand the despair in Alberta, and I believe passionately... Order. Order. We're good to go. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. I believe passionately, Mr. Speaker, that a strong Alberta is essential to a strong Canada. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, what we need for that. And I'm going to quote the Calgary Chamber of Commerce. We need real decisive action on climate change. The success of our businesses, the well-being of our families depend on it. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, for 20 days now, blockades have been erected all over Canada, and the situation is only getting worse. Trains carrying goods have been crippled, and the tension is escalating. In an interview, the president of the Industrial Parks Corporation of Quebec City, Pierre Colbert, said, This is absolutely ridiculous. If something doesn't change, the most vulnerable businesses may not survive the crisis. The prime minister's total lack of leadership is causing serious damage to businesses throughout Quebec, and there's no end in sight. When will he finally act? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker. We understand that there is an impact on the economy, there's an impact on those who have been laid off. We're very aware of this, and the Prime Minister has been acting since the very beginning. We are working very hard to remove these blockades, but these are provincial jurisdictions in the three provinces that are affected. But we are working for these blockades to be dismantled as quickly as possible. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker. Contrary to what he says, the Prime Minister is doing nothing to resolve the crisis. Rather. Meanwhile, Resolu Forestry Products is planning stoppages for production in its sawmills in Quebec and Ontario, and two of those plants are in haute mauricie Up to 5,000 workers could be affected. He preaches to other countries, but he can't even fix our problems here. Is there someone who can take over on the other side? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker. We are here to resolve the issue. As my colleague has pointed out, we are aware of the impact on many areas, including the forestry sector, the agricultural sector. We're fully aware of the situation. And that is why 
we have started making progress. For example, yesterday there was a line that was partially reopened and the first CN, CN train was able to run between Montreal and Toronto. And we hope that soon all those trains will be running throughout Canada. Or Chilliwack. Oh. The Prime Minister's weakness has emboldened those who continue to illegally blockade our ports, roads and railways. The Prime Minister is also blocking investment in this country by cancelling approved projects and creating insurmountable political uncertainty for others. Hundreds of billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of jobs right across the country have been lost as a direct result of his weak leadership. When will the Prime Minister finally stand up to the anti-energy activists in his own caucus, stand up to those blockading our economy and stand up for Canadian jobs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government has been steadfast in its support for the hardworking men and women in our oil and gas sector. It's why we approved the Line 3 replacement project and why we always supported Keystone XL, where construction will soon begin in the U.S. Let's remember there are thousands of good, well-paying jobs that have been created in Alberta and B.C. because we did the hard work to get TMX right. We believe in the workers in the sector. We believe in their families who have their backs. That's what we now. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. The Prime Minister's weak leadership is also failing Indigenous communities. When he killed the Northern Gateway Pipeline, he stole a 33% equity stake and $2 billion in economic benefits from Northern Indigenous communities. When the Tech Frontier Mine was cancelled because of the political uncertainty he created, the Prime Minister tore economic hope out of the hands of the 14 Indigenous communities who had signed agreements in place. How does it advance the cause of reconciliation? when the Prime Minister does everything that he can to keep Northern Indigenous communities in poverty forever. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, this was a decision taken by the company. We respect that decision. I'm sure it was a difficult one. I will say, though, that, that during the process, the environmental assessment process that was conducted under SIA 2012, that the company did incredibly good work in engaging Indigenous communities in Alberta near the project. That is certainly something that can be a model for companies going forward. Here, here. The Honourable Member for BCB Bay James Nunavik EU. Mr. Speaker. Ever since this government abandoned leadership on the rail crisis, the situation has degenerated. The blockades are multiplying throughout Quebec and elsewhere. Just when he decided he would hide away from this conflict last Friday, the Prime Minister said he wanted to engage in dialogue. But it takes two parties to have a dialogue, Mr. Speaker. My question is simple. What are the two ministers responsible for Indigenous affairs doing here? Why aren't they on the ground engaging in dialogue to resolve this crisis? The Honourable Minister. Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the urgency of this crisis and its impact on Canadians from one ocean to another. We are hopeful that we will be able to peacefully resolve this crisis and that's why I have been in regular communication with hereditary chiefs over the last week, and I have communicated that we are available to meet in person anytime. The Honourable Member for Abitibi Bay, James Nunavik, EU. Mr. Speaker, workers are the ones paying the price for this Prime Minister's incompetence in the rail crisis. In my writing, Resolu Forestry Products has had to lay off 200 people on Monday, and no date has been set for a return to work. What will the government do? This is 200 families who are deprived of income while they wait not only for blockades to be lifted, but also for the rail system to get back to normal. How can this government afford to not do everything in its power to resolve this crisis? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we fully understand the situation, and that is why we are working around the clock to resolve this issue, and we have been doing so from the very beginning. It's important to have a dialogue. It's equally important that the blockades come down so that our rail services can start up again. This is what we've been working on since the very beginning. We are working on a short-term and a long-term resolution. McMurray Cold Lake. Mr. Speaker, oil and gas projects are being built all over the world 
except in Canada. With tech being forced to cancel, 14 Indigenous groups lost out, and 10,000 new jobs are gone. I would call this a failure, but we know the Liberals view this as a win. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge that Tech Resources Frontier Oil Sands project was killed as a result of his government's anti-oil and gas policies? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, as I've said a few times, the decision was taken by the company itself, not by the government. I know it was a difficult decision. Tech Resources' decision in the letter that was provided by their CEO shows the need to have serious climate plans that incentivize innovation, that cut pollution, and that ensures our economy stays competitive for the long term. We are doing just that with a price on pollution. We're moving to exceed our Paris targets and working to be net zero by 2050. We have a serious climate plan that we will be working with Alberta, we will be working with the oil and gas sector to ensure that we can meet it, and meet it in a way that will incent the development of a clean energy sector. Excellent. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister's weak leadership, anti and energy policies and delay tactics continue to drive investment away from Alberta. In fact, expenditures in the energy sector are now $42 billion lower than it was under the previous Conservative government. And with the cancellation of the tech mine, this Prime Minister has overseen almost $200 billion in cancelled energy projects. When will this Prime Minister stand with Albertans and our First Nation communities, defend the interests of Canada and stop killing Alberta industry yeah. energy yeah. projects? As I said, Line 3 is complete and in service in Canada. We did the hard work necessary on TMX and construction is underway, creating thousands of jobs. There have been over 8 billion in new petrochemical projects. Thousands of jobs linked to those projects. These are real investments in our energy sector and real results for Canadian and Alberta workers. Merci, Mr. President. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Mr. Speaker, after 10 years, Tech cancelled their Frontier project five days before the government had a deadline to render a decision. Why? Was it because the government had been telegraphing that they would cancel it and reject it? The member from Kingston and the Islands across the way promoted, promoted a petition against it last week. Frontier was balancing the environment and the economy, something this Prime Minister often inanely repeats. Why is this Prime Minister turning his back on the 14 First Nations supportive of Tech Frontier in favour of dirty oil from other countries? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This decision was a decision taken by the company. We certainly respect that decision, and I'm sure it was a difficult one. As the Tech CEO said in his letter, we need to move past jurisdictional and partisan fighting. We agree, and we are working with all orders of government across Canada and with the resource sector to ensure that we create good jobs and ensure clean and sustainable prosperity for all. The Honourable Member for Lakelands. This Prime Minister's weakness, dithering, and delays is what forced Tech out, and it harms the whole country. Now, yes, Yesterday, the Liberals could have said a resounding, passionate yes to me about Alberta, but only Conservatives fight for all of Canada. The value of oil and gas to Ontario's economy is more than half the auto, auto sector. Oil sands companies buy the most supplies from BC, Ontario, and Quebec. Atlantic Canadians and Albertans are inextricably linked. Every oil sands job creates five jobs in other provinces and other sectors. So why are these Liberals puppets for anti-energy activists to phase out the oil and shut down Canada. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I very much hope and I rely on the hope that one thing we can agree on on both sides of this House, that we all believe in the importance of national unity. And that we I just want to remind the honourable members that when somebody asks a question, we want to hear what it is, but we also want to hear what the answer is. Is it has it been changed? Okay, the honourable member for. Uh
uh, Campbell Powell River. Sorry, go ahead. North Island Powell River, Mr. Speaker. Last Friday, the Prime Minister could have saved a lot of time and asked the Conservative leader to hold his press conference for him. But their plan to send the police in is not working. Chase is not on the case. For weeks, we've been calling on the Prime Minister to name a mediator, sit down with the hereditary chiefs and de-escalate the situation. CP Rail is recommending that. Industry is recommending that. Indigenous leaders are recommending that. So what's the holdup? When will the Prime Minister admit his Conservative plan is not working? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I think it's very important to acknowledge that there's <laughs> some very important work that is going on in British Columbia between the British Columbia government, a former member of, of this House, Nathan Cullen, and our ministers in discussion in the RCMP and the hereditary chiefs and the leadership of, of the, the Wet'suwet'en community are at the table and there are important discussions going on. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have to recognize and acknowledge the impact that these barricades are having on Canadians from across the country. And it was important to ask the people on those barricades to recognize the impact that their actions are having on ordinary Canadians and to take down those barricades. And it is the responsibility of the police of jurisdiction where the laws is not being obeyed to uphold that law and we have confidence in their ability to do so. Absolutely. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Hamilton's light rail project is a rare opportunity that has shared support of City Council, big business, organized labour in the community. It is a much needed investment in public infrastructure and mass transit. It will create jobs, it will help the environment and it will uplift the economy. But the gong show Doug Ford government recklessly pulled provincial funding and derailed this critical project. Time is running out. Will this government partner with the City of Hamilton and help get our LRT funded and back on track? The Honourable Minister for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to be part of a government that is making historic investments yes, in public right. infrastructure. We support local governments in their work to improve local infrastructures. In fact, my hometown of the Hammer, Hamilton, has secured over $500 million in federal investment in infrastructure money uh, and other projects. We're a committed funding partner. However, on this specific project, we have not yet received a formal request from Ontario. We remain eager to work with the province and the city to get public transit built. The Honourable Member for Whitby. Without question, our government has made bold and unprecedented investments to grow the middle class and help those working hard to join it. But we know that far too many Canadian families are still struggling. In a country like Canada, one family living in poverty is one too many. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development please update the House on the work being done to combat poverty in Canada? The Honourable Minister of Family, Children and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the really important question. And the work. Mr. Speaker, since we got into office, we have prioritized the fight against poverty and growing the middle class. And our plan is working yes. uh, through key investments in Canadians and according to the Canadian, uh, Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian uh, Income Survey, right. we have uh, achieved the goal of helping over one million Canadians. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that is the largest reduction of poverty in Canadian history. We'll continue to work towards the future where each and every Canadian has... No, no, the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins, Les Vies. Mr. Speaker, whether it's the railway blockades or the coronavirus, it's the same lack of leadership from this government. Dr. Tam said yesterday the signs are concerning and public health officials are preparing for any eventuality. The WHO is preparing for a pandemic. The situation is very worrisome. The risks are huge, but the Liberals are twiddling their thumbs. What is their plan to help protect Canadians from the coronavirus? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
that Dr. Tam is uh, working very closely with our international partners, but more importantly with our, our provincial and territorial, territorial partners. As the situation evolves and as the World Health Organization raises its alarm around a country's ability to contain the virus, we shift our focuses to domestic preparedness and make sure that provinces and territories have what they need to respond to any potential outbreak. Let me be clear, this is a situation of grave concern for the world and we're on it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, with at least 33 countries reporting cases, 11 cases confirmed in Canada, and over 80,000 global cases, we're now being told to prepare for a possible COVID-19 pandemic. Other countries stopped flights in and out of China. Canada didn't. Other countries immediately introduced strict, strict screening measures. Canada didn't. Now we're being told the window of opportunity for containment for stopping the global spread of this virus is closing. Can the health minister confirm that she is satisfied with the actions taken to date? Good question. The minister of health. And the measures that the member opposite are talking about are ones that are found during the containment phase. In fact, we did have screening for pa uh, passengers that were coming from the most heavily affected regions, but now that we find the coronavirus in at least 35 countries, many that may not be tracking the virus, those measures are less effective, and it's time to turn our attention and our resources to making sure that we're prepared on the domestic stage. I will remind the member opposite that Italy had some of the most restrictive travel uh, quarantines and, in fact, has two significant outbreaks in two communities under quarantine. Thank you. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Alberta Court of Appeal struck down the federal carbon tax as unconstitutional. The majority opinion called the carbon tax a constitutional Trojan horse, as it would set no limits on federal government power. For this Liberal government to impose an expensive public policy unilaterally when it was of clear national importance and national unity implications was reckless and tone deaf. When will the Prime Minister work to actually reach environmental targets and scrap this unconstitutional carbon tax. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, we've already heard from Ontario and Saskatchewan courts that this, uh, this approach is fully within federal jurisdiction. The Alberta Court of Appeals decision is one step in the process. This will be adjudicated in March before the Supreme Court of Canada. We are very confident that uh, federal jurisdiction will be upheld. I do find it odd, however, that the party opposite, which professes to be a party that believes in the market, rejects a market mechanism which is the most efficient way to reduce emissions here, here. in favour of a more expensive regulatory approach or perhaps just an ap aspirational one. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Is bankrupting Canadian farmers across this country, That's and the right. no numbers are only going to get worse unless something is done. That's Ontario right. grain farmers paid $12 million in carbon tax last year just to dry their grain. The carbon tax will cost hog farmers $22 million by 2022. Wow. A grain operator in my riding contacted me last night. He is going to be paying close to a million dollars in carbon tax over the next two years. Wow. Enough is enough. The Alberta courts have found the carbon tax to be unconstitutional. When will the agriculture minister cancel her farm-killing carbon tax? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know how concerned farmers are by all the stresses they're experiencing, including bad weather in 2019, international trade concerns, and then railway blockades. We understand the situation, and that is why we have put in place a whole risk management system. And I'm working hard with my provincial counterparts to improve those programs. There are measures that were put in place to help specific industries, including the, uh, relief for the carbon tax for farmers. President, the Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, while the WHO is concerned that COVID-19 will become a pandemic, pandemic, here health professionals are concerned about the lack of federal preparedness. Vi virologist Carl Weiss laments the lack of effective coordination from Ottawa. If the government is managing the public health crisis like it's managing the rail crisis, then there's cause for concern. Can the government reassure the public and explain its contingency plan to be a leader in the fight against COVID-19? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. 
Speaker, and thank, I thank the member for his question. In fact, we've been working very closely through the pandemic plan that Canada developed after the time of SARS that has many permanent structures in place and other urgent structures that can be raised up in situations like COVID-19. I am very confident that under the leadership of Dr. Tam and the Canadian Public Health Agency that we are working closely with our federal and provincial territories to understand and know what they will need to uh, be able to respond to the uh, uh, outbreaks as they may happen. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to quote Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Doc, Doc, Dr. Theresa Tam, and I'd ask the Minister to respond to this. We have to prepare across governments, across communities, and as families and individuals in the event of a more widespread transmission in our communities. Mr. Speaker, the federal government has a crucial role to play in public health, transport, and border security. What is being done to get ready? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to hear the member opposite uh, quote Dr. Tam, who is, of course, our Chief Public Health Officer of Canada. She and I and many other officials have been working very closely to do exactly what he's proposing, to have a, a substantial plan that not just deals with outbreaks of, of coronavirus as they may occur across the country, but to prepare Canadians for what that means in terms of disruption of their lives. For Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, the illegal blockades have held our country hostage for over 20 days. Days, and every day the situation gets worse. The Prime Minister's weak leadership has emboldened these radical activists. They know that they can shut down bridges, highways and other critical infrastructure without consequence. Yep. And now they've shut down the Lakeshore West GO train, preventing thousands of commuters from getting to work. The situation is spiralling out of control. When will the Prime Minister end these blockades? Yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker, as, as I think most people would understand, there are injunctions in place and there are laws that need to be obeyed. The Prime Minister has been very clear, urging people to obey the law and, and to take down those barricades. Mr. Speaker, we also have confidence in the law enforcement officers of jurisdiction who are well trained and understand their responsibilities and are endeavouring to, to resolve these barricades and these blockages in the most peaceful way possible. We will continue to maintain our confidence and to support law enforcement and the provinces in their jurisdictions as they endeavour to clear these blockages and resume service for all Canadians. Last evening, at the peak of rush hour in GTHA, another blockade was set up in the tracks near York Boulevard in Hamilton. These illegal protesters are disrupting the GO train service to Hamilton and Niagara, and it continues today. This adds to the already unbearable gridlock that my constituents face daily. Meanwhile, the elected representatives of the Wet'suwet'en people support the projects these protesters are actually opposing. When will the Prime Minister act? and end these illegal blockades. The Honourable Minister. Just I'd like to, the, the member opposite to understand that the responsibility for actually enforcing the law with respect to those blockades is the responsibility of the police of jurisdiction operating within the provincial jurisdiction of authority. And, and so it has been made very clear, and the police are doing that job, but they're doing it in a very responsible way. Mr. Speaker, their, their responsibilities require that it be done peacefully and effectively. The Honourable me Member for Remission, Matsky Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, yesterday, illegal protesters blocked the West Coast Express commuter train in the Fraser Valley again. The BC Public Safety Minister declared, and I quote, the police do not need an injunction to clear and arrest the blockaders. When the BC New Democrats call out illegal activity and advocate for police action, this Liberal government has to know that they're asleep at the switch. I never thought I'd say this, but when will the Public Safety Minister take a page out of the BC NDP playbook and get our rail lines cleared? Mr. Speaker, I recall a time when, when the Conservatives actually believed and entrusted law enforcement to do their jobs. As a, as a matter of fact, and as I've quoted in this House, they have previously stated that they have full confidence in the judgment of the RCMP and they respect their operational independence. Mr. Speaker, our government continues to, to respect the law and those who have been tasked with upholding it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Orleans. 
Mr. Speaker, in this era of rapidly changing technology, the government can turn to new tools such as artificial intelligence to improve services to Canadians. Could the Minister of Digital Government please inform the House how the government is using AI to improve service to Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Digital Government. Th I'd like to thank the member for Orleans for her question. Canada is a world leader in artificial intelligence, and we're using this knowledge to improve services to Canadians. From tools that improve the safety of marine transportation in northern waters to technologies that help revitalize Indigenous languages, we are using AI to better serve Canadians. We've developed a directive to ensure that departments fully understand their responsibilities and the risks associated with using AI. For Charleswood St. James, Assiniboia Headingley. Mr. Speaker, seniors, rural residents, and those without internet have been unable to access the information and tools they need to file their taxes. The Liberal member for Winnipeg South Centre's office said it best, and I quote, this is a very poor reflection on an organization that is already viewed by many as being very insensitive oh, to the clientele right. it's trying to serve. Oh, absolutely. The minister has failed Canadians for five long years. When, shall we, when will she stand up to her agency and fight for everyday Canadians who are just right. trying to file their taxes? Absolutely. The Honourable Minister. 1.7 million Canadians still choose to file paper tax returns, and the agency sends packages to those directly, those who filed on paper the previous year. And for those who haven't received their package, they can call the dedicated line, and they can download the package or order one on CRA's website. Let's not make a storm in a, a tempest in a teapot, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Léhable. Mr. Speaker, could the minister go to bat for Canadians for once? CRA does everything to make their own work easier and to complicate things for people in the regions who don't have internet access. Even in Winnipeg South Centre, the minister's colleague says they've received many calls from very angry constituents who can't get their forms. They feel that CRA is very insensitive to clients they're supposed to be serving. When is the minister going to clean house? The Honourable Minister, I would, call, I would remind colleagues opposite that they're the ones who cut back on all the tax packages that were mailed out by Canada Post in the past. We sent out 1.7 million packages after 2018 to people in the regions, to seniors, to people who fill out their tile, tax returns on paper. The Honourable Member for Beauce. Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister has repeatedly stated that all stakeholders were wi widely consulted during the ongoing con discussions on CUSMA and its implementation. When asked yesterday at the Trade Committee, the Dairy Farmers of Canada made it clear that they hadn't been consulted at all. This government continues to neglect its agricultural sector. In the dairy sector, the government has relinquished sovereignty and control. Why didn't the Deputy Prime Minister consult the Dairy Farmers of Canada? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it was a Liberal government who created supply management, and it was also a Liberal government who protected supply management. It's important to note that the U.S. government's goal at the beginning of the consultations was to completely dismantle that system. We defended it, and we will continue to defend our supply management system. The Honourable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Mr. Speaker, last year the government announced Canada's first ever food policy with a view to ensuring that everyone living in Canada has access to an adequate supply of healthy food. Every day across Canada, community organizations are working to make a difference by improving access to healthy food. 
As a result of this policy, $50 million has been allocated to create the Local Food Infrastructure Fund to help these organizations. Can the minister give the House an update on this fund? The Honourable Minister of Agric Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to announce that the first round of funding has been distributed to 240 approved projects across the country from the Local Food Infrastructure Fund. This fund helps community organizations improve their infrastructure and purchase equipment to enhance food access accessibility. Other projects will be funded in the second uh, round and an announcement will be made in the spring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Indigenous people are standing up across this country demanding respect and justice. Their message, enough is enough. The reality on First Nations is getting worse. This week, a seven-year-old boy died in a house fire in Garden Hill, a community with third world housing, no running water, no all weather road, in a region of 13,000 people without a hospital. When is this government going to recognize that systemic racism and underfunding is killing people? When is this minister going to act to ensure justice for the Knott family and for Indigenous communities across this country? The Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, my deepest condolences go out to the family and the entire community of Garden Hill for First Nation for their loss. My department has been in contact with the First Nations leadership to identify and deliver support to ensure the well-being of the community. We understand the stressful nature of the situation. We'll continue to work with First Nation partners on timely and appropriate supports. And as a matter of policy as government, we are striving to close that socioeconomic gap that has existed for far too long mm -hmm. and with historic investments in infrastructure and housing. We strive to get there, and let me say this, Mr. Speaker, we will get there. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The waters around the southern Gulf Islands are being used as a free anchorage for freighters waiting to enter the port of Vancouver. The environmental damage, pollution, bright lights and noise from these freighters is impacting island communities and wildlife. Some of these vessels are waiting to load U.S. coal, thermal coal, for export because Pacific U.S. states refuse to export thermal coal from their ports. Will the government mandate improvements in efficiencies at the Port of Vancouver and ban the export of U.S. thermal coal through Canadian ports? Yes. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, as, uh, as the member probably is aware, the new interim protocol for anchorages was developed in partnership with the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, the Pacific Pilotage Authority, industry stakeholders and communities to respond to the immediate concerns of certain coastal communities. The government's long-term strategy will be aimed at improving the management of anchorages outside of public ports with a view to ensuring the long-term efficiency and reliability of the supply chain and mitigating environmental and social impacts. I want to thank the member for his question and advocacy on the file. And that's all the questions for today. That's all for today. Uh, I have two points that I'd like to bring to the attention of the members. 100 years ago, in the winter of 1920, the very first Parliamentary Security Corps was formed. Until then, the Dominion Police, which merged with the Royal Northwest Mounted Police in 1919 to become the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, had patrolled the grounds of Parliament Hill. But when the parliamentarians of the day decided they no longer